Plug in and diagnose only. Recovered in. Possible fuel injector. Pump issue. Pushed into workshop and connect to easy computer. Read faults. Found injectors. Clogged. Stick in. Removed covers. Blanked injectors. Off one at a time. Still not starting. Monitor fuel pressure. Found to be low. Check low pressure fuel system and pump in tank, not pumping. Checked power supply to pump and found low feed. Checked fuses, okay, but two others had blown, replaced. Requires wiring to be traced and checked. Trace wiring from tank pump and found no feed. Checked wiring diagrams and checked feed from EDC, BCM and all. Okay. Traced wire into corroded wire in chassis. Repair wire. Checked low pressure pump. Okay. Bleed up system and found to start. Resecured all wiring and refit all covers. Remove computer and take vehicle for road test. All okay. All fuel pressures okay. Alright, so it's been quite a while since I've done a video, hasn't it? Um, yeah, apologies for that. Um, this one is really kind of um, talking about the experience that I had with, I guess, a fear that many people that live in their vans, um, it's one of the fears that I guess lives with you, or certainly lives with me anyway, on a constant basis. And that's the fear of your van breaking down and what you do when that happens. So this is really telling the story of how it affected me and the various things that happen and um, scenario, consequences, whatever you want to call them. The things that I had to go through um, and how that whilst van life yeah, does have its many pros I think there were t far too many cons that go with it which ultimately um, make the whole experience quite difficult um, and rather challenging I won't talk too much about the actual incident itself because I think what I'll do is I'll just insert um, the little video snippets that I took at the time um, because I sort of you know I, I had parts of it which I took on my phone uh, other parts which I recorded on the Osmo camera so I'll kind of insert those parts to kind of tell the story a little bit more because there's no point really sort of going through the absolute details of it at this point um, because I think there's enough information there to cover what was actually happening on the ground at the time. Um, I guess that this is really a reflective kind of um, talk about the incident and kind of the the repercussions or the things that follow on which I think a lot of people probably who go into van life don't really consider and those that are in van life have probably never really considered before so I guess those are the parts that I'll reflect on now but yeah 25th of October was um, the dreaded day um, where the van broke down on me and um, literally just came to a halt on the middle of a road um, and fortunately I was able to coast off. Um, I'll insert the footage of as close to what was happening at the time and you can sort of see at first hand what it was all about. Right, so where do I start? So, sit rep. What's the time? <laughs> it is half past two in the afternoon. 
at about quarter to 10, maybe it was about 25, 20 to 10, um, my engine cut out. An EDC light came on, um, then the engine light was flashing red, I lost all power, I uh, was dropping through the gears, coasting, I had cars behind me, etc. on this um, single carriageway uh, road, which is pretty quick. Everything just whizzes past here at sort of 60 or more. Um, and uh, I got the hazards on and I coasted. There was nowhere on the left for me to go and then managed to find this little turn off into a farmer's field. And there was, funny enough, a um, a little bungalow just from here um, but I had the uh, peace of mind to just sort of go beyond that and I found this place thank fuck um, anyway pulled in called the RAC the RAC gave me a estimate of two hours I waited so I went in the back put the kettle on put the diesel heater on had a cup of coffee um, watched a bit of Netflix uh, two hours later um, or more another call saying you can have to wait another two hours eventually the RAC man calls me I speak to him on the phone and after some deliberation he realized that it was something he wasn't going to be able to fix here it needed to go to a garage and then not only that uh, he then told me that they couldn't recover me because it wasn't on the policy etc even though I've been paying for this policy for three years or whatever been paying monthly to RAC uh, it's quite clear the size of the van etc etc at no point did they ever think hey maybe we should call Rob and actually tell him that he's on the wrong policy he won't be able to be recovered so um, I then get on the blower uh, I'm on the internet trying to find recovery places garages etc no one is touching me with a barge pole Prior to me making the calls, I thought, well, I'll go to the bungalow just up here, just out of courtesy, just to see who it's filled that I'm parked in, because I know that I'm in the way, potentially. And the woman was really, really nasty to me. Uh, basically said, well, you can't be there. It's my field, uh, move it. I was like, well, I can't move it. She says, well, you have to, you're on private property, move it. I says, well, if I could, I would, but I can't. I'm waiting for recovery. She says, it's gonna be, have to go on. If not, um, I'm going to get someone with a tractor and we're going to push you out onto the main road. And she says, you should never have parked there, you're trespassing. Um, and I said, what, would you rather me leave the van broken down on the main carriageway in front of your bungalow? Uh, and she says, well, that's not my problem. You're on private property, move it. Slam the door in front, in my face. Um, so I've come back, I've been spending hours trying to find a place. I'm now waiting and these little dingalings that you may have heard in the background is whatsapp with a lovely uh, girl called leanne from ams recovery she's on her way out to assess the situation um, let's give you a live sit rep and see what she says she says no problem uh, we're based in hemingbrough bum, bum, bum. i won't be able to take car payment if i come to you so if you're going to do that bank transfer okay fine it's all about payment it's probably going to cost me 250 notes um, to get it shifted from here, literally two, three miles up the road to where my work is. I'm that close to work. It's ludicrous. Um, but anyway, I'm waiting. Um, in the meantime, I've had a call. I'm hopefully waiting for the next couple of hours or so for a recovery truck to come along and tow me out of here. Um, in the meantime, the woman has come along and has parked herself behind me in the carriageway in the opposite carriageway with no hazard lights on got out of her van out of her car rather um i'll insert some footage of her car and her leaving away but she basically verbally abused me and told me to effing move oh, i shouldn't be here how dare i blah blah blah, well, blah. so was that woman that was just driven away me. there has just um, given me how i had the sort of peace of mind not to be abusive back to her uh, she wanted my Nothing. name and number an because she's going to threaten terrain. to uh, so bill me for obstructing because apparently there's a combine uh, harvest so she on its way here, here even though there's nothing to combine here because it's a field with view. horses um, and this is the bungalow so, you know, behind me um, okay and I pulled in but anyway yeah combine harvest is coming she's thank god not into her driveway you're not getting my name or just pulled into she took this my number uh, she threatened to call the little farmers in my trust here I've been more than happy for the police to come in here um, and deal with your abusive behavior. Um, she even said that I was, um, what did she say? Um, I, I don't know, it wasn't abusive to her, but it was another A word um, that, um, anyway, yeah. Um, 
I won't get into it, but she's a mad woman and um, I think she works for one of the Northern Rail companies because I saw a little bad. So I'm going to find out through HR and uh, see if I can suss her. I certainly won't, won't forget her face because, um, yeah, um, she has a face that you can't, uh, well, it's easily forgotten, but um, easily remembered as well, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's the sit wrap, okay? Uh, I'm going to change the battery in this Osmo because uh, there's going to be loads more footage, I'm sure. I think ultimately the trouble that I now sort of look back and realise um, was, I guess, my sort of, I don't know, uh, the Achilles heel, let's say, of, of living in a van was that I was obviously let down by my... Um, what I thought was going to be the recovery service, i.e. the RAC. Um, I'd been paying for over three years direct debits um, in the assured knowledge, or what I thought, well, turns out to be a false assured knowledge, that if I was to ring them, they would be able to come and help me and get me out of um, that situation. And that didn't happen. So therefore, I'm then having to uh, find another uh, alternative means to be able to get me recovered from a bad situation. It's not a bad situation, you know, at the time I managed to find myself in a place where, yes, it was awkward because I was sort of off on a farmer's field, etc. Um, the recovery was going to be a bit awkward because it would have meant sort of closing down part of the road, etc., etc. Um, and then there was all the shenanigans that I had with the woman from hell who just, for whatever reason, that day got out of the wrong side of bed um, and decided to basically, um, yeah, vent all her anger and frustrations from probably most of her life, to be honest with you. I don't think it was just that day. I think she just wanted to just uh, literally... Um, yeah, probably all of the misgivings of her husband, or God, God forbid if there was a husband, uh, but whomever was in the background, poor soul, whatever it was, um, it was coming my direction that day from that particular woman. And uh, so having to deal with all of that, etc., was just awkward. Uh, so it kind of necessitated me having to get out of that situation as quick as I possibly could. So therefore I had to then find alternative methods, um, even going from my own insurance company, they let me down uh, just through the fact that there is no number to contact in an emergency or anything like that. Even going online onto the website um, was still struggling. And then when I was online, I was then put in a queue uh, with this sort of chat box of having to then talk to someone. So, there's all of that hiatus of trying to get out of a situation stuck in a field where you really don't want to be the owner of the field really not wanting you to be there and uh, threatening to get you moved on in all means necessary uh, so that you don't um, interrupt her life anymore God forbid um, and yeah then just having to sort of then spend however long trying to find somebody that would help me. I think what's quite interesting is when you are reliant on a service, i.e. the RAC or AA or Green Flag, whomever it is that you use, um, it's interesting really that I guess and it's not that I took it for granted, I was partaking and paying for a service which I generally thought was legit. So to have a situation where it takes three and a half hours and then the actual guy that is coming to rescue you to be the one to tell you, oh, by the way, you're on the wrong policy, therefore I can't pick you up is quite staggering. Um, 
see, you know, a white van pulling up on your land um, just brings out the worst in people, you know. Um, suddenly I'm a jippo or a traveller about to just take over her land. God knows what was going through her head. Um, but, yeah, it was quite disturbing, really, and it's a shame, really, that society's got like this, you know. I mean, if, if I were in that position, you know, I'd be offering that person a sandwich to come into my house, have a cup of tea, um, and be able to settle down, you know. Um, now, fortunately for me, this is my house, and I was able to sit in the back and make a coffee and put the heater on and, and have, you know, uh, watch a bit of Netflix, etc. But um, if it weren't for that, um, it is now, I don't even know what time it is now, I think it's something like six o'clock in the evening, you know, and I've been at that place since half nine, quarter to ten, and I'm finally now at my destination. Um, so, you know, that was a long time if this wasn't my house and without the heat and etc to just be hanging around by the side of the road, which therefore also begs the question with, you know, help what the hell are RAC playing at? You know, I've been paying them for three years and finally when I need them in an emergency, they they can't take me. And not only that, my insurance company, I couldn't even get hold of them. Um, there was no number to phone, I went onto the website and in the end you're in a chat, where like a room where you have to chat to someone and even then they didn't answer. So I'm gonna be trying to get a phone call with them and find out why the hell they wouldn't answer someone who was in, you know, for me at the time, you know, it's been fairly chilled, you know, I've not been panicking at all, but it has been quite a stressful day. And to have the two companies that I pay money monthly to not help me in any way whatsoever um, is really quite appalling. So um, I guess, you know, that kind of highlights the, the sort of, the fragileness of and the fragility of living in the van and you know maybe it is you know I've got to really double check that what's going on and what I've got in place when you think everything's sorted and you're paying this money that actually behind the scenes you're not covered at all um, and so yeah I think it is a lesson for a lot of us to to, to learn and to to take heed really because um, I think yeah potentially what you think is okay and what is going to be your safety net actually isn't there whatsoever so um yeah let this be a warning and be aware double check phone up your insurance phone up your breakdown cover and make sure that you are all legit with them um i thought i was and obviously i i'm not so this is something else that i've got to sort out anyway that's the end of that particular rant but anyway uh, yeah eventually AMS come out and um, Leanne comes in uh, the big wagon uh, ironically another Iveco and um, gets me out of that farmer's field and gets me onto the road and makes everything safe then has to drive up the road do a UE, come back to pick me up, etc. And um, I remember just standing on that road and I was sort of taking footage with the camera and everything. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, this is, yeah, it was going through my head. These are the pictures and the scenarios that you see happen to so many other people. And you think, God, I hope that's not me. And there it suddenly is you and you're like, shit. Um, and yeah, it was quite interesting, suddenly kind of thinking, well, I've, I've done well and, you know, have I just lucked out? Is over three years with no breakdowns, was that, a good, you know, was that good? Um, I don't know. But you're just sort of, yeah, you kind of do feel somewhat sort of, yeah, you, your dick's dangling in the wind somewhat, really. You know, you are sort of like very, very um, kind of, out there and uh, sort of exposed, so to speak. But yeah, um, Leanne did an amazing job. And then, um, yeah, there were some issues with the wagon, but we got Neo onto the back and he was all strapped down and all sorted. And then getting back to the only place that I could think of 
So here's another issue, is that you get back to a place. Uh, I don't have a home because that is my home. There's no garage that could see me at the point that I was going round on, on the internet in the van, stuck in that field, trying to find places. So, you know, I don't have a friend's place that I can go to or anything like that. There's no one like that for me. So you're stuck and um, so you, I just get it back to the department, to the only place I know. I need to be in a position where I can still access work and everything like that. And so I go for that option. So a sit rep update. Um, it's been recovered. Uh, we had a bit of trouble with the bed on the back of the truck, but we managed to get it on. And we're here at the back of the, the department. Seems to be the sort of safest place to take it. A um, place where it's reasonably quiet and hopefully I can then get a mobile mechanic to come out and do a diagnostic. Um, but yeah, as you can see behind me, Neo's still on the back of the flatbed because the, uh, the flatbed uh, has broken. <laughs> so um, we can't get it off at the moment. So we're waiting for another recovery unit to come along to see if they can fix the problem with the flatbed. And then we'll get Neo off. Because and no we'll then park wrong. him just over and my shoulder here. So I get towed back, etc. And then there's a problem with the wagon, with the hydraulics. So uh, Leanne's in a situation where she can't do anything. So she has to then call for the cavalry. Um, and uh, we wait some time for the recovery to the recovery to come out. And um, I think it's Ryan, he comes out in the, uh, the van and um, after some time manages to sort of do some mechanical wizardry to get the hydraulics of the bed of the truck to work or you know work to an effect that can actually get the bed to move so that we can get Neo off the back etc. So this was all just stuff that you know happens it's not their fault it was just one of those things and but you know they dealt with it really well professionally and um, ultimately always had my best interests at heart sort of thing you know which was always sort of comforting to know and then we get him off and we get him all secure and I get him onto blocks because I know that I'm going to be there for a while potentially so we get him all leveled up and everything and it's in a place where I've been before. It was in the place that I was in during uh, ooh, the third lockdown, I think it was. Um, so I'm used to, to, to being there, even though it can be a little bit noisy, um, certainly with all the building works. But anyway, that's a small issue. Uh, they go away. Now, before they go away, Ryan does a di diagnostic. And the diagnostic is telling me that it is either a fuel injector or a fuel pump issue. So that's all I've got. That's the only information I've got. And I then have to sort of then go through the process of now trying to find a garage who will actually fit us in and can actually fix it. And that took some time. Bearing in mind, I'm now in a position at work where it's getting quite busy. Um, and so I didn't have the free time in order to explore and find places and make all the phone calls, etc. But eventually I do find a place and I think it's, I think I'm sat out the back there for maybe three, four weeks. And eventually I get it into an Iveco dealership in Hull. So of course I've got to get it moved. So I phone up AMS again because they did a good service the first time round, so I get them uh, to take me to Hull and drop me off and we then leave there. I come back to York because I have to come back to work and not knowing how long it's going to take in the garage, I have to sort of make a gamble. So here are now 
the things that are basically making this whole venture and this journey of van life and this particular situation and this, I guess, this um, fear um, of what could happen when you live in a van really start to sort of manifest and rear its ugly head to some extent and show you its true colours because you've now got cost of uh, recovery twice and now you've got cost of a garage which you don't know what's wrong with it so therefore you have no idea how long it's going to be in there so I take a gamble and think it's going to be a week so I book myself a week's worth of bed and breakfasts which at the time uh, the bed and breakfast in York by the way if you come to York it's a nice city but you know it's not cheap and you don't get breakfast as part of your deal okay so when you think of bed and breakfast the good old days when it used to be 10 15 pound yeah fuck that it's not that anymore it's more like 40 50 quid a night and you don't get breakfast okay so that's one thing to, to bear in mind that actually accommodation isn't cheap um, and you know they weren't particularly nice places where I was staying either um, they were budget and um, but anyway I booked myself a week's worth and the fix is done literally within two days so I didn't need that but by that point it's too late for me to cancel my second booking which I'd booked for four or five nights because it was going over a weekend etc uh, so I was going to lose my money anyway so I may as well have just stayed in the hotel in the bed and breakfast rather which I did um, so that's a huge cost um, and then obviously then there's the charge of the actual uh, garage etc the fix and I think these are the things that I want to share with you guys you know, especially sort of newcomers to this that these are the hidden costs that potentially could really fucking bite you in the ass, and it certainly did me. Um, in total, this whole experience nearly cost me nineteen hundred pounds. And at the start of the video, what I'm reading is the report of the diagnostics and what the mechanic went through in order to fix it. The crazy thing is, is that it was two 18 pence fuses 36p to fix the van and maybe a piece of electrical tape or whatever it was that was put round the wire or whatever where it was earthing on the chassis um, and yeah it was a very expensive um, recovery <laughs> because you know I've got the cost of two recoveries the cost of bed and breakfasts for seven days I think it was uh, transport trains taxis buses etc backwards and forwards to haul uh, backwards and forwards across uh, York because I was staying the other side of York both times and then ultimately the cost of the garage uh, man hours which is just astronomical and yeah shy of 1900 pounds the whole experience uh, comes to and uh, so it is kind of rather sobering and um, certainly puts into perspective how volatile this life is especially if you're someone like me who is not mechanically minded at all hasn't got a scooby with regards to what's going on underneath the van or anything like that um, and you are kind of very much at the mercy of uh, professional garages in and around the area that you live and if you're not fortuitous to know anyone that is a mechanic or knows of a good mechanic in your local area etc you really are at the mercy of the gods and um, in this particular instance it wasn't favorable um, financially for me anyway but anyway he's fixed now or is he because the crazy thing is is that you come out of you know you're out of the fire and in, into the frying pan or is it out of the frying pan into the fire whatever way round it, it fucking bites and it hurts because literally 
a day or two after me getting my van out of the garage in Hull and driving back to York is where I then discover that my rear light on the left hand side isn't working, my brake light isn't working, my um, number plate light isn't working get pulled over by the police a week or two weeks in uh, breathalyzed for the first time in my life because it is the Christmas period um, and um, yeah now have to go through the whole thing um, we're now in January by the way just in case you know so this all happened in October it's now January and I'm still waiting for the appointment for the garage to now fix the next problem I've booked my hotel it's not ex as expensive and I've only booked for five nights so fingers crossed it's going to be all right and it will be fixed um, and I can get the van to the garage under its own steam and the garage is in York but I can very much anticipate that this is going to be a very expensive job so within the space of very short months in my endeavour to try and put money away the whole point of living in a van to save for a deposit etc it's one step forward two steps back because any bit that I save now looks like it's going to have to go towards the van so um, yeah it's shit really um, but hey that's the way it is and you know I think it's one of those things that I think you know you have to realise that actually you know sometimes things go well for you sometimes things don't um, it really is an absolute gang gamble um, living van life is like throwing a set of dice every fucking day um, and yeah you win some you lose some um, so you know I guess just let this be a uh, a cautionary tale in terms of Make sure you're covered properly and have a chunk of money or something in, uh, put aside and come up with a plan B, you know, whether it is staying at a friend's or whatever. I, I didn't have any of those, unfortunately, so I was stuck. Um, and, um, yeah, realised that, yeah, once that van is in a garage, you really are in the lap of the gods because you have no idea how long it's going to take and then also ultimately you have no idea how much it's going to cost so um, anyway hopefully there'll be more cheery things to come on this channel um, after this particular one I've been holding this video for such a long bloody time now and I've been finding it really difficult to to actually talk about um, but it's out there now hopefully um, and um, you know thanks to AMS for caring and getting me out of a situation away from that awful w woman and um, you know I guess it's a tale to tell to the kids at some point isn't it and round campfires at meetups cheers